Good hello and welcome to the final episode of, I suppose, maybe season one. I'll see if I end up doing another run of these uh, these short videos, these short videos, these videos again in future. So, welcome to Talkie Time, the thing that I've inexplicably called that for some reason. So these are basically, if you don't know, informal, unscripted discussions. I suppose you could say, about whatever given topic we happen to be talking about. And today we're going to be looking at the gays. So, we'll be looking at several people with relation to the gays. So we're looking at Sartre, we'll be looking at John Berger, Laura Mulvey, uh, Bell Hooks, Michel Foucault, and also Franz Fanon. So, looking at quite a couple of people, and also I'll probably also bring up Edward Said. So, we're talk looking at uh, quite a couple of people today. Now, Firstly, there's a, a little concept that we need to discuss. First of all, the idea of a subject versus an object. So, generally in philosophy, we would say that we, humans, are subjects, which means that we are thinking things, we are able to have thoughts and feelings and uh, desires and goals and interests and whatever, right? That's what we're able to do. We are a subject. Other things around us are what you would call objects. They are other things. They're, they're things. They're things that you can touch, the things you can use, etc., etc., etc. Now, it has long been a um, an aspect of, of um, difficulty, I suppose, in certain philosophical traditions and what have you about who gets to be considered, right? who actually gets to be a subject. There's a lot of, um, you know, racism, misogyny, all sorts of things that have been happening over, you know, human existence, where we've been trying to say, oh, no, no, the, this group, because they are a different color, or this group because they have different genitals, or this group because they're a different class, whatever, they are not subjects, they're not thinking things, they're just whatever. And also, of course, other things um, out there that we might think about, um, that we can classify as things. Uh, when I said things before, I didn't mean it in an object sense, just stuff. So other groups, you know, so obviously there's that, that human aspect. But then there are other things, like animals, plants, etc. Are they necessarily objects, or do they also have some kind of an inner life? Now that's, seeing as the, the previous couple of videos and like the previous like mini-series in those other videos, they've all been about animal studies stuff and ecofeminism, and all of them would pretty much say that no, animals are definitely subjects. I'm not going to go into that now because we've already essentially discussed that kind of an idea before. I haven't really looked at plants before, but you could make the argument that plants also are something that is capable of, uh, has some kind of a consciousness of some description. It might not be a consciousness that we can fully comprehend, but perhaps they do also have some kind of subjectivity to them. But we're talking about here specifically how we are looking at things, right? Now, it sort of originates with Sartre in his book Being in Nothingness, which the book itself is quite a long, very long, difficult text. And it's all about... It's, it's about existentialism. It's, it's a foundational text, pretty much the foundational text of existentialism. And essentially, it looks at what is a subject uh, versus what is an object. But the section that is important is, at least to this particular aspect. So now we're already thinking, right, a subject is like a thinking thing. It's able to have its own consciousness, it's et cetera, et cetera, right? It has its own thoughts, desires. Cool. So that's a subject. We are subjects. Cool. Now, Sartre says that sometimes we can also be for others. Sometimes we exist for other people. Not just for ourselves. Like we don't just have our own personal subjectivity. We also actually exist in relation to other people, which is quite obvious. And he then talks about the look. Now, the look, more commonly, like now, pretty much would be called the gaze. Although in being in nothingness, it probably is just called the look. In my copy of it, it it's called the look, but it's it is the gaze. They're the same thing. So this, the the look or the gaze, is the moment of essentially a, a realization of sorts that when someone 
right? Because now I'm, I'm, I'm existing, right? I exist as my own thing. I am myself. I am a conscious being. I know that I exist, etc., etc. But then what happens is I see another person. And I see that that person is looking at me. That person, now it doesn't have to be, not like they're staring at you, but they, they see you. They look at you. Their eyes pass over you. It doesn't matter. They have seen you. And by seeing you, you realize that in them seeing you, they have conceptualized you as an object in their world. Right? Because we all have our own subjective worlds. We all have, you know, everything that exists, exists for me. But that respects to everyone. Everyone is like that. The world that you experience is your world. But then you notice that other people also have their own worlds. And they look at you. And you are no longer a subject. You become an object in their world. Which is through the gaze. By looking at you. By perceiving you to exist. And you then realize that you do essentially the same thing. By looking at others. You objectify them. You turn them into objects. Because ultimately... Everything in the world around us is an object to us. We are the only thing that is not an object. And I don't mean like humanity. I mean you as an individual person. You are the only thing that is a subject in your world. Everything else is an object. Now, it does depend on how you treat. It depends a lot on how you treat an object. But everything around us is technically an object. Uh, everything alive, everything not alive. You know, uh, Other humans, other animals, uh, plants, rocks tables. They are all objects to us. They are things that are physical. We can see them, touch them, whatever. They are things. So this then creates the realization in your mind, essentially, that you are looked at and looking at. You are both an objectifier and objectified. You are something that exists as an object in somebody else's world, and you make others an object in your world, which is kind of like a grounding aspect to it. Now, he didn't discuss a lot of other things with regards to this, and other writers would essentially look into that. So that's where we're going to move on to, right? So that's your basic gaze idea. Now, we're going to first look at, now I've, I've been in very brief, termed them under objectifying gazes, discriminatory gazes, and regulatory gazes. However, they are, in many ways, they're kind of all, all of them. Because even like, say, regulatory gazes are still objectifying gazes. But I, this is just as like a, a little thing uh, to make it a little bit easier for structuring. So we'll first look at the most famous uh, version of the gaze, which I've considered a, an objectifying gaze here, is the male gaze. Now, this was originally formulated by John Berger and then later ex uh, elaborated on uh, in terms of theater, or not theater, in terms of cinema, I mean, by Laura Mulvey. So we're looking at basically both of them. Now, John Berger, in his in his book uh, *Ways of Looking*, it was also like a it was also like a show, but I've only read the book. Um, so, in this, he elaborates on various various things about art, pretty much about how we're looking at art. And when he brings up the male gaze, he's talking about images of a woman, a naked woman, or a sexually provocative woman, and saying that this is for the benefit of the male gaze, right? The male, by looking, by it being, it's not even just because you're looking. The male gaze is that the person who painted that picture, right? That person created it knowing that a male would want to see it. It is there to accommodate a male. And this is something that was then elaborated by Laura Mulvey in her uh, essay, Visual Pleasure, um, I can't remember the exact, the full title, but you have visual pleasure. And that then looks at how in film, everything is geared towards the male viewpoint. Uh, it's very, very easy to see this. It happens like all the time. Probably the most egregious place, I would say, and it's one of my biggest criticisms of the, I suppose you could call it the medium, is in anime. Anime does it all the time. There will be, say, you know, um, where the camera is specifically positioned so that you can see sexy, or so that you know you can you can see certain shots of, say, a woman bending over, or a panty shot, or something like that. 
Those are all male gaze things. They're assuming that the audience is male and therefore accommodating to the male gaze. They're saying, okay, you want to objectify a woman? You want to see woman as an object? Cool. Well, that's what we're going to do for you. We're going to show you some sexy legs. We're going to show you, you know, sexy breasts. This character's going to have cleavage and the camera is going to really focus on that cleavage. That is the male gaze from a cinematic perspective. So these two go together, John Berger and Laura Mulvey, although well, I don't actually remember if, if Mulvey mentions Berger, but um, Mulvey is really the one who really applied it further and, and took it to better, higher places. Um, so the, the, more, the common idea of what the male gaze is is definitely attributed to her, as it should be. And this, then, you can understand why film is then catered towards men. And so women will feel like they are not treated as subjects in that sense. Now, you can elaborate on the male gaze further and take it outside the realm of theater, of the, excuse me, theater, outside the realm of cinema. Say, for instance, when you are walking somewhere and a and you check out, now this will be, if you're a woman, you are checked out by men. You know, they, they look at you. Or, of course, if you're a man and then you look at woman. What you are doing, if you are the man in that particular situation, you are objectifying the woman. And a lot of the time, that's the thing, woman, it's not like, oh, I'm going to sneak a, a quick look at that woman's ass as she walks past. Much of the time, women do notice this. So it's, you're not actually being like all clever and sneaky and getting a, a nice little peek. This is part of... It, it's It's... Part of oppression, it's a, a way in which women are objectified in our society in such a way that they are then meant to accommodate the male gaze. They are meant to look appealing. If you do not look appealing, then you will not get, you know, the same kind of, uh, there's many things. Like if you, if you don't, if you're not an appealing woman, then you'll be discriminated against for various reasons. But if you are unappealing so let's say you you make yourself specifically so that men don't check you out let's just say now it might not even work right men are creeps and they all often look at anyone um and creep them out but but even though you're creeping them out they will still get less as women if if they do not play the game and accommodate to the male gaze You'll see this in many places where women will not be treated the same if they, you know, say don't put the amount of effort in that no man would ever be expected to put in. So this all becomes part of the male gaze. Everything is there to accommodate men. If you do not look appealing as a woman, well then obviously you're not, you know, worth our time. Now yes, maybe you'll get catcalled less, but probably not. But maybe you get catcalled less, but you also quite possibly could be, for instance, passed up for a job because there are biases that men and men tend to be the ones in positions of a power and with the ability to promote people and we have a bias towards people who are attractive and so that is a thing that then happens the male gaze is more than just oh it's it's for like gratification watching cinema no it has real world implications for people and also not to mention the fact that being watched by a man is voyeuristic, creepy, and it will make you feel like you are under threat. Now, this is from a woman's perspective, okay? I, you know, born, raised, whatever, as a male, I have never once felt uncomfortable in public. Whereas many, many women do feel uncomfortable in public. But this is a thing that is unconscious. I basically eventually had to start when I was at university reading feminist theory and stuff before even realizing any of these things because you don't realize them because you're in a society that does not inform you of this and so men just continue being awful um, without even realizing it and never educated about it and never never know and then when they're confronted about it they get angry because they're like no no I'm not being a creep Okay, you're just attractive. I like looking at attractive women, and you don't even realize that that's creepy. Like a lot of men don't realize that that's that's actually like a violent act. That is a form of pretty much light stalking. Like it's not, it's not good. It's not sexy. 
So now, going from Mulvey, there was essentially a response to it uh, by bell hooks, the oppositional gaze, which she was specifically also looking at cinema. And she was saying, yes, Mulvey, Mulvey is correct there. However, however, Mulvey is centering white woman. And she says, listen, black men still get, sure, if you go to like cinema, cinema is, especially back, you know, back in the day, full of racial stereotypes. It still is, but not maybe not as much as it used to be. Full of racial stereotypes. Now, black people also went to the cinema. They also went to see these things. And they saw these racist depictions of themselves. However, in the sense... Bell Hooks looks at this and says, black people, first off, are even like worse represented in media. So when when um, black people are gazed at in cinema, what have you, it isn't so much for a sexualizing thing. We'll usually be, say, you're gazing at the black male body as a thing of violence. It's dangerous. It's savage. And there are all these stereotypes that reinforce this view, which also when you keep on seeing it, when you keep on gazing at it, it reinforces those kinds of beliefs in your mind. So when racists see racist depictions, they can, they can just go, oh, you see, that's the way it is, and be reinforced, and then use that to try to recruit others to their viewpoint. Now, she looked at this and said, no, no, no. That's obviously all that, that, that stuff is is bad. However, black men still get to have the male gaze. They still essentially get to check out woman. The depictions of black men are usually terrible, but the depictions of white woman will be very sexy and what have you, which then will still appeal to any male gaze, including black males. And she here in the oppositional gaze specifically focuses on black female spectatorship when Black women are the ones watching, who have been massively underrepresented. You don't even like really get many black women um, in cinema. At least now it's better. Obviously, this was written like long ago. But essentially saying, listen, there there just aren't that many black women. And when the black women are depicted, they're either invisible, like they're just set dressing. They're just they're there, right? They're not like characters. Or if they are characters. They won't be even sexualized. They'll have other kinds of, of roles, things like the mammy role or something. They they don't get any kind of uh, representation, really. So she was saying, listen, like Mulvey's right, but she didn't go far enough. She didn't also mention black people. And this has been a blind spot. Um, well, blind spots, ableist language, which you use by mistake. But uh, a gap, if you want to be more academic, um, less ableist about your language, a gap that you make, or that has been noted in a lot of feminism, especially early feminism, was a complete exclusion of non-white people. Now, it's, it's better now, but it is still, you know, generally not great. You'll often see this in, like, for instance, the area that I just did a lengthy series about, ecofeminism, pretty much like all of them are just white women. Like, there, there aren't any, like, non-white people. So this is a, a recurring issue in a lot of feminist work. And the oppositional gay specifically is the idea that we, that say black women in this particular case, they see this kind of lack of representation or just terrible representation and they don't even get the male gaze aspect. So they instead become opposed to it. They become antagonistic towards it. Essentially it's a form of of rebellion against it. The oppositional gaze is where you are standing in defiance of something, where you are opposing it. Because defiance actually, there is like a distinction between defiance and, and opposition. Opposition is more active. But that's essentially what you're doing. You're opposing it. You're actively fighting against it. You are noting the gaze and then fighting against the gaze. She also brings up in this particular case how, but this will get into more when it comes to Fanon, um, but she mentioned at the beginning of her essay a very like interesting point in that as a child, she was told, now she's a black woman, and she was told as a child not to stare. Now, first off, we're kind of all told not to stare as children. Like, it's a thing children do. Children stare. That's what they do. Uh, but it's considered to be rude. However, from her perspective, black person, 
staring, let's say staring at a cop, can be considered a threat, which the cop will then, you know, I mean, she was writing from an American perspective, and if you know anything about American policing, um, you might know why it's not a good idea for a black person to be staring at a cop. So, you know, not great there. But that is a very important point there, which we'll then go into when we talk about Fanon, which we'll be speaking about soon, um, in the more sort of post-colonial black and white gazes kind of a of a thing. Now, before we do that, I want a quick aside, because he doesn't really fit in anywhere else here, but just to bring it up, the medical gaze. Now, this is uh, Michel Foucault. And when he was writing in The Birth of the Clinic, he was talking about essentially how modern-day hospitals, clinics, medical profession, essentially, came about and developed and changed over time. And how, at one point, doctors were encouraged to see patients as subjects. You look at the entire body, right? You look at everything. Then it started to shift. It wasn't about the person. It was about, no, 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 you are not a person. You're an object. Like, the way doctors see you is as a problem. They see you as a problem that needs to be solved. So they will look at composite parts. They will not look at your whole. They will not look at you as a subject. They will only look at the individual things that are wrong and try to fix that thing. But not because it's like, oh, no, you're a subject, but because you are a, a puzzle that can be solved, that can be checked out, that can be, that can be worked over. The medical establishment sees humans, sees its patients, not as people, but as things to be fixed. They are like mechanics. Now, many of them may not think this way, but this is the way you are trained to see things. You're not trained to see it as a person. For instance, look at how um, a lot of the time, if they're going to perform a painful procedure on you, they might not tell you fully that, that the pain that's going to go into this. They might not actually explain to you that this is going to be sore. They will rather be like, no, well, this is the best option. There isn't really another option. And so you're going to have to go through this pain. Which, yes, maybe you do have to go through that pain, but they don't really take into account the fact that this is, we say, painful or invasive or anything like that. They'll just see it as, well, this is the way to solve the problem. If you do not want to solve the problem that way, I cannot solve the problem. So you are trained as a doctor to not see people as people, but as things. A broken car that needs to be, that needs to have the right parts replaced and fixed. You are fragmented into pieces. This part of you is broken. Well, I need to fix that part of you. I don't need to look at the rest. And this is also where it's like sort of the one area in which I can have some sympathy for why um, people, for instance, prefer homeopaths or some people prefer homeopaths because homeopathy tends to be more of a holistic approach. They will not look at, oh, your leg is sore. Let's look at everything. Now, homeopathy is um, nonsense, but that is a much better way really, to approach the idea of medication and helping people than to just say, I'm going to fix that one problem. To rather look at the whole and try and, you know, make it operate better, not just as a, as a, as a, you know, tool that needs to function, but as a, as a living subject that needs and wants and desires to have a better existence. So, that's the medical gaze. Now we're going to move into these more discriminatory gazes. Now, as I said, like, the male gaze is also discriminatory, but this one is explicitly discriminatory. So your more post-colonial type gazes, as you would have seen in someone like Fanon, um, black skin, white masks, or in Edward Said's Orientalism. Now, this, where you get sort of the colonizer gaze slash white gaze, uh, colonized gaze slash black gaze, now, this is essentially an implicit form of violence that happens. Fanon, when speaking about this in Black, uh, Black Skin, White Masks, was basically talking about this exact thing, where when the colonizer, so the white person in this case, sees you, looks at you, gazes at you, they render you into an object that is inferior to themselves. You are a thing. In you, if you look at the old colonizer states, now obviously it would change now because now it would be more so racist rather than just colonizer. But if you look at the old colonial states, the colonized people were not considered to be people. They were effectively living tools that would do jobs for very, very low wages or, of course, at the highest level of, of sort of exploitation. It would have been 
slave. And then it would be more like a, a slave gaze versus a slave master gaze. And that's also a thing that uh, Bell Hooks does mention is that when black people were enslaved, they were, um, do not stare. If you stare at, at the master, the master will beat you because that is, as we, we looked at with, with Sartre, when you look at something and that thing looks back at you, you are essentially creating a relationship. You are both acknowledging the other as a subject, but as an object. You're both acknowledging each other's object's objectness, and that also affirms the subjectness. So if you are being looked at by a slave, like say you're a slave master, you're being looked at by a slave, you cannot not see that person as a person because you can see that they are gazing at you. You can see that they have thought and understanding behind those eyes. And that is a threat. First of all, because it might make you feel bad when you start thinking about it and go, you know, it probably isn't right that we can literally enslave human beings. That probably isn't a good thing. You don't want to think that, first of all, because you have your you know, business tied up in this whole slave thing. So you can't have that. And also, when the slaves start to see themselves as on par with you, when they see you are also just a human like me, they might rise up. They might eventually realize that they could actually fight. And no slave master wants a slave rebellion. So that becomes, it's, it becomes an implicit form of violence, according to Fanon, where when the white person is looking at you, you cannot look back. You cannot look back at the colonizer, because if you look back at the colonizer, you could be hurt for that. You could be perceived as a threat. Right? He mentions like the idea that he was sitting on a, a bus or train, I think probably a train, and um, there was like a little girl looking at him, and he realized that he was looking at her, and then thought, oh no, that, that's a problem, because immediately you just think that's enough. If you're, uh, you know, at all understanding of the world, the expression, you know, there's a black man on the train staring at me, that, that scares a lot of people, and that could then lead to you, as say that, say the white mother of that child, going to a cop and saying, that black man was staring at my daughter. Now, a lot of the time, you do stare, you, you watch, you look at people. It, it's an instinctive thing that we do. We look at each other. And that has been vilified. It has been turned into something negative, something bad that is to be punished. And that cop could then come up to you as, as a black person and say, why were you looking at that child? Do you have any intentions here, whatever? And, I mean, they don't really care. They could just do anything to you. So the gaze, while being something that, like, you know, you can't touch the gaze. It's not like a material circumstances. But it has very, very real um, circumstances on you as a person. Very, very real, very material um, downsides to being gazed at slash gazing at something. All right. Now, Edward Said also essentially looked at this kind of thing. Um, from a post-colonial perspective, in which the West, so like more so the white gaze, looks at... Um, now, he was talking about specifically Oriental countries, which are sort of Eastern countries. Also, Oriental is such a ridiculously broad term. Like, Oriental includes Arabic people, Indian people, uh, Chinese people, Japanese people. It's like all of them. If you're to the East, you are <laughs> you are Oriental. Um, also I think Mediterranean is also Oriental. So this was the way in which white people would look at and then discuss and describe the way in which certain other groups were perceived by them. You know, oh, you're, you're a white explorer and you've gone to visit the Middle East and oh, they have such a quaint culture. They have and then you explain it in your books and you publish these things. And there's essentially this gaze without even having to actually physically look that you are still looking upon the these other peoples and creating, turning them into objects that have their own, that have some kind of specificity to them that we can then see as inferior to our own. We can be like, oh, look at them. Their culture is so backward or whatever. Uh, look at ours in comparison to ours. But this is all facilitated through a um, an incomplete gaze. It's not a personal gaze. It's a gaze by proxy. You know, you're looking through the works of somebody else who might not be entirely telling the truth or who might not understand the culture because this is also a thing. When you're from a different culture and you go to a certain place, it, you can get things like culture shock. Um, now I'm remembering this like randomly, but there, uh, I remember a concept. I wonder if it's actually called, 
let me see here. Um, Japan, and it's called like Paris Syndrome or something. Paris Syndrome, let's see. Um, yeah, Paris Syndrome, I'm right. This is basically a form of intense... Um, it's a form of intense disappointment. It's a form of culture shock, which like you wouldn't think would cause like a problem. But when you have been trained for such a long time that say the French are the pinnacle of of class and and culture and what have you, and the Japanese people go there and they are so like horrified by what they see that they get an intense form of culture shock that they can't handle because the proxy gaze that they have about this so-called great country of culture has been shattered by the reality of the situation of an extremely, you know, uh, busy, messy, stinky city. Uh, the stinky thing, I haven't been there, but I've been informed by people that Paris smells. So I don't know if that is true, but that is what I've been informed by someone before who has been there. So when you go from another country there and you go, oh God, this is not what I thought it would be. The gaze has basically been subverted and broken. And you've realized a reality of the situation that it isn't actually... You know, that, that's the whole thing with... So we've been talking about the colonizer gaze. What about the colonized gaze? The colonized person, the black person in this case usually, or a person who's not white, basically looks at the white people. And because of the way in which white people have presented themselves and they've presented their culture, people tend to think, oh, no, no, they are better than us. But then you go there and it turns out they're not. <laughs> and um, they're often terrible and that kind of breaks the illusion, but the illusion is still there. That like, oh, there's a there's a class, there's a class to being French, there's a, you know, there's there's a class to being British or German or something like that, which isn't true. You're just a human. But those people, the people who have been gazing now at the colonizer, so the colonized looking at the colonizer, have been reinforced with this idea, this projection of what is not real. So yeah. That's like a discriminatory overview of, of the gaze. Now, the last one I want to look at is more of a regulatory gaze um, slash disciplinary. And this goes back to Foucault. Now, Foucault developed this idea called panopticism. Now, first, we have to actually explain what a panopticon is. All right. A panopticon is a theoretical prison designed by Jeremy Bentham, who I've actually mentioned before because he... Uh, is a utilitarian. He's like one of the founding members of utilitarian ethics. And he created this idea for a sort of a perfect prison. Prison goes like this. It's in a uh, sort of cylindrical, you know, a circular structure with all the cells around. And all the cells face a central guard tower. The guard, there's only ever one guard in there. But there's like, say, a bright light or something obscuring whether or not you can see the guard. Now, here's the thing. What this does, then, is that everybody in the prison does not know whether or not they are being watched. The guard cannot possibly watch everyone. That's impossible. However, however, you don't know if they're watching your cell at this particular moment. Are they watching me right now? I can't do anything because, you know... I might be seen, the probability of me being seen is very, very low because of how there's only one guard and there's so many cells, but it's a possibility. He could be looking at me right now, so I can't do anything. And the idea here is that it enforces self-regulation. You then do not do things because you're afraid of being seen. Now, Foucault basically said, listen, we have created our own panopticon. You cannot do certain things right, like you as a person, there are certain things that are socially undesirable, but you do not do them. Why do you not do them? Well, you're choosing not to do them, but you're choosing not to do them because you might be being watched. Someone might be watching you at any time. Somebody might be looking at you. Somebody might be noting your actions. Now, this has become especially prevalent in the age of like a surveillance state where we've got cameras everywhere and watching us, but you do not want to do certain things because, well, what if the neighbor's watching? What if someone is watching? What if someone says something about this thing I've done? And this then forces us to regulate ourselves. So the police don't need to be an overwhelming you know, uh, force on us for us to be like, oh, no, I'm afraid of breaking the law because what if someone sees me? 
eye. And this is like an extension of the gaze, like a much further elaboration, because you're being watched all the time, you're being looked at, but you don't know whether or not you actually are being looked at at this particular moment. Like, for instance, right now, I'm in front of a computer. Many of us are in front of computers. How do you know? How do you know definitively that your camera hasn't been hacked? Like if it's a laptop, how do you know that your webcam hasn't been hacked? Now, yeah, sure, you could you could pop a, you know, you could put some stuff over it to cover it. Sure, sure. How do you know someone hasn't hacked your your speakers, your your onboard microphone? How do you know? How do you know that someone isn't listening to you right now? And then when you go out, how do you know there isn't a camera somewhere? And when you're in public, how do you know someone isn't looking at you? How do you know? And the answer is you don't. And that's why you don't, you know, when walking down the street, suddenly, I don't know, decide to, like, do a dance and urinate on a wall. You don't do it because someone might be watching. Now, technically, it's within your freedom to do whatever you want. But you don't do what you want because what if someone's watching? What if somebody is rendering my actions into something objectified, which can later be used against me? So... I do nothing. I obey the law. I act like a good little boy, girl, or anything in between. And I do not do what I've been told not to do. So, that's sort of some elaborations on the gaze. There are many other sort of variations on it. Um, The gaze is a very interesting overall concept. And I think before I I finish off here, I want to leave with a, a little funny story. Now, I teach, one of my subjects I teach at the moment is sociology. And I had to teach sociology to a couple of of guys. Um, (laughs) And I said to them, and usually I do this when I bring up a key term like this, I ask them whether they've ever heard of it. And usually it's a no, but if someone has heard of it, then they can talk about it. And I can either, you know, say, yes, you're right. Or you need to look at it like this, blah, 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 blah. Doesn't matter. And I said to them, have either of you ever heard of the male gaze? And I got the best ever answer. Because they then started talking about homosexual men. The male gaze. And I was... I was taken aback at first because I was like, what are you talking... Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. Gaze as in look. As in look. It's looking. Looking at something. Not, not, not gay people. Not male gaze not the gay people, gays with a, with a Z. Uh, and that is just, to me, in that moment, it was one of the funniest little academic hiccups. But anyway, we are going to end off there. Uh, I hope this has been somewhat informative. And um, yeah, if you are interested in the other stuff I do, because I, I do a lot of things, uh, this will be the last of the Talkie Time videos for a while. I plan on having a video out... Uh, later this month, which is will be January when this comes out. I'm recording these things like way ahead of time um, because I'm, uh, I've been very, very busy. I don't know how busy I am when this came out, but uh, as I'm recording, I'm a very, very, very busy person. Uh, I have lots of things I have to do. So that's why I'm, I'm recording all these so far in advance. But it'll be done and there'll be a new video coming out, which will be something. Uh, I have an idea what it's going to be. But I do not want to say definitively for in case. But it should be fun either way. And then I'll probably end up doing a couple of other videos about theory. And at some point, maybe I will start sort of a second season of Talkie Time. We will see. I think Talkie Time is good as a, as a time in which uh, I don't have much time on my hands. And so I can just talk about the things that I'm studying. But yeah, that will be it for today. So if you did enjoy this and you want to check out the other stuff, you can look in the description. There'll be all sorts of whatevers. And you can do the likes share, subscribe, comment, the things that, you know, they always tell you to do the smash your like button, that kind of, do that. Um, And anyway, other than that, please have a fantastic day, week, month ahead, and goodbye.